Michael Dweck is the director of The Truffle Hunters, the documentary that's made the shortlist for the Oscars Best Documentary Feature category. I'm Matt Noble of Gold Derby, here to ask you, Michael, um, Truffle Hunters, all about finding truffles. You're a director trying to find shots. What was the shot that was the sort of hardest for you to find and get right? Well, I think um, I think finding a cinematic language for the film was probably the most the most difficult thing to do. Um, it, at first, we started to experiment with all different ways to shoot because when you know when you're making a documentary, typically you shoot everything, right? You're you're, you're very anxious to kind of not not um, not miss a moment. But in our case, we kind of just spent three months uh, just observing, not shooting a thing just trying to immerse ourselves into this world to really understand it um, to a point until, until the world kind of spoke to us and told us what it should be. And, and a lot of what we started to talk about were paintings. You know, this world to us seemed almost like a, too good to be true, like a fairy tale, very much like a storybook. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we stumbled upon this place uh, separately, Gregory and I, and, um, you know, there was something very different about, about this place. It, you know, it's, it's a place that seemed to maintain their identity and their connection to history and, and culture and not be, not be like destroyed um, by uh, globalization and commercialization and technology, which is refreshing because I, I live in New York. Gregory lives in Stockholm, but he's from New York. We both live in the same building together. That's how we met. But to us, it's so different to be in a place that, um, that moves at a very, a very different rhythm. Like every hilltop has a little town, there's you know, beautiful vineyards, um, it's spectacular. Um, but what's more interesting to us is that it seemed to be removed from the modern world and that, that unique rhythm. And so that's, that's how the language, the cinematic language uh, of the film came to, came to be, is that we've just decided to frame these almost like paintings, going through a storybook, painting by painting by painting and let the audience really sit and observe, because our, our objective was how do we how do we uh, use the, this, the the power of cinema to to immerse the audience and make them feel the way we we felt in that place. How do we do that? That was our, our challenge, and the way we decided to do that was these these paintings, pretty much, with the exception of the doggy cams, which <laughs> you know, is a point of the dog. But that's that's the long answer to that question. Yeah, and I guess because of that sort of world that you discovered, there's a real timeless quality to the film. You probably could have made that film ten years ago, and it would have been yeah. a similar story. Um, what was what was the thing that surprised you most about uh, that world? Well, the big surprise is that nobody would tell us about it. It was a secret. Nobody <laughs> wanted to tell us a thing. You know, we. I think the first day we were there people were asking us why are you here in the middle of August because there's nothing to do you know in this town and they said why aren't you here in November so what's November and they said it's it's truffle season white truffle season and uh of course we didn't know what that was and and the guy said yeah they're these white truffles you can't you can't cultivate them you can cultivate black ones but they're like they're like gold nuggets they're really hard to find and I said well how do you find them and the trattoria owner would say to us well there were these old men We've never met them before. They're, he took us outside this way up in these mountains. They're really weird. We don't know anything, you know, we don't know much about them, but they they have this this sense to be able to find these things. And but the funny thing was that guy had a had an under glass like five beautiful truffles. And I said, Well, where did those come from? And he was like, ah. and I said, Well, ah. and then we pushed and he said, Well, come outside. And there was a brown box outside. He says, Look, I put 50 euros in that box at night. And the next morning I come out and the truffles in that box, but I don't know who that person is. And then on the wall, he showed us written in pencil from 1940s till the night before every truffle he's ever bought, how much he paid, the initials of who the truffle hunter was, but of course he didn't tell us who that was and, um, and um, uh, how much he paid. So <clears throat> that of course led us on this, this journey of, of spending three years trying to immerse ourselves in this community that was, you know, that was a secret. So we ended up going to the priest in the town. That's how we started. Yeah. And the priest said, ah, okay, well, I'll tell you who the truffle hunter is, Carlo. He's not going to talk to you. He won't tell you he's a truffle hunter, but he's a truffle hunter. He's a truffle hunter because every Christmas he gives me a truffle. 
So of course we went to, we asked the introducers at Carlo with the Carlo cause like, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not a, I'll tell you who's a truffle hunter. A Gidio is a truffle hunter. He's at his next village with Regidio's just like, no, 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 no. Carlo is a, yeah. so this kept going, you know, so the priest introduced us to someone else, to someone else, someone else. And eventually we we met a way into this in this community. But we it was a lot of it was just spending time with them over espresso, a lot of espresso, a lot of wine, just talking because it's in that community you don't just we don't speak Italian we don't speak Piemontese let alone that dialect so it, that was always interesting it, it's a small cruise is Gregory and I behind the camera and we have a translator um, and we have a sound person and but we were there just so long we never left <laughs> we just kept there like oh nice knowing you and I said well we'll come back tomorrow but we kept coming back and back and eventually we became you know they became like our extended family and only when it felt right um, did we start pulling out a camera? Hmm. Having like immersed yourself in that community, what, what do you what do you miss about it most? Well, it's uh, it's so um, it feels so good, especially now because we're living in a pandemic and none of us can go anywhere. Um, but it feels so nice uh, to be connected to a community and. Um, to be surrounded by by family, and and they have something. It's really interesting because they they have no phones, no iPhones. They don't have any computers. They have no television sets at all. But yet they're they they're there's something really refreshing about being there. We we couldn't wait to go back. Every time we'd go, we'd say three weeks there, spend a week back home. We couldn't wait to just go back again because to us it was such a it was such a, a refreshing experience to 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 be in this place where we didn't have to rely on technology to communicate with people you know there was like i just give you one one example of how this place works we wanted a pregnant dog we wanted a pregnant truffle dog to film the life cycle of the whole dog and we had asked a veterinarian in this one town in lange and he said no i don't how am i going to find a pregnant truffle dog so i just asked so then we be driving like 40 kilometers south uh and we stopped for an espresso and we go inside the cafe we've never been to this cafe before and the woman says to us, uh, are you the guys looking for the pregnant truffle dog? <laughs> and I turned to Greg and I said, did you say something before I got here? He said, nope. She handed us a piece of paper, say, call this guy. He's ready for you. Whenever you want to go, he's, he's all yours. And that's, um, and that's exactly how that place works. Everybody just, um, you know, everybody is, it, it's beyond the kindness. Everybody there just wants to welcome you into this, this community. It's, and it's a real sense of community. It's not like, you know, a, a community that's on Facebook. This is, uh, you know, it's just quite different than that. Like you, you touch on like how sort of secretive this community was about the truffle hunting and things like that. What, what, how have they thought about the film since it's released or about to be released and being made? Are they, are they yeah. Well, it's, it's so we had this whole thing planned. The plan was, you know, it was, it, it, it was premiered at Sundance. And then it got into Ken, into the main selection. So we were going to bring the truffle hunters and the dogs on the red carpet. The whole thing was planned. And then we we're going to have the Torino Film Festival right after that, because that's the their home region for that festival. Everything was perfect. And then the pandemic hit. Uh, so they have not seen the film. They have never been to a movie in their lives. Huh? They haven't been to a cinema. Whoa. So, uh, so what we planned to do is what we had originally planned to do. There was this town, San Damiano, throwing this big block party pretty much it's like a big 150 person luncheon party and then we're going to have the premiere of the film in a 1930s movie theater it has these old projectors that the guy got cranking again uh so we're going to show the film there and uh uh so hopefully that's going to be late summer early fall uh but it'll be you know sony which is great at, you know it's great they stick to theatrical so we're, you know this movie has to be seen in the cinema because it's it's in many ways, it's um, it's it's a it's, it's a canvas. That's how you know. My background is I'm I'm a, I'm a fine art photographer, mm. and um, I always think in you know I, I always think of how can I how can I bring an audience uh, into a place and show them the subjective truth of this place. I'm not interested really. You know, yeah. If I if if you, if you take a photograph of I look out this window, I see trees and I see some some houses and cars. Um, 
but then there's a there's a way of taking that photograph which puts you into that place. There's a way of putting your audience and making them feel something, and that that is kind of the the objective is that when when the audience experiences this film that they they just have the same feeling that uh, that we had being there. And sound has a lot to do with that. We spent a ton of time on sound recording. You know, three years worth of sound library because when imagine like you have these hinges that are like you know 18th century hinges and these marble floors, like Angelo's cutting a cheese. See, Angelo's making soup, he's making chicken soup in that scene where he's cracking wood and burn, you know, the, the wood's burning and he's he's hacking up the chicken and vegetables. Um, he's been walking on that same floor and his parents and grandparents and great grandparents walked us so that marble is like this beautiful cavern and his marble mm -hmm. going back and forth. But we wanted people to, to how do you how do you smell that? How do you bring the audience to smell the, the world of the truffle hunter and this and the forest and uh, so a lot of it had to do with, with sound. Like there's one scene at the end of the film where you see this, our truffle judge is eating this truffle, is shaving over the plate. And this is beautiful Enrico Caruso music from 1926, a really raw music. What you really hear, if you listen carefully, the theater is that the sound goes from the audience, the objective sound, and then all of a sudden it's, as he's taking more and more of the truffle inside, he's eating it this pleasure and bliss comes over him and it just goes in his head and he's just completely consumed in the world mm -hmm. of the truffle, the, the pleasure that this thing gives him. And that's, um, you know, something we, we accomplished with this, this soundscape. We had microphones on the dogs. We developed little tiny microphones like rice kernels so that the dog's nose, it was on the paw, it was on the truffle hunters. So we had this beautiful, uh, soundscape going back and forth as they're hunting. So the dog point of view, you can you see them looking at Trouble Hunter, the sound kind of flashes back and forth. Um, and that was also really important to us too. How does the audience experience the hunt through the point of view of the dog? Yeah. The, um, you've, we're an awards website and you've um, uh, been shortlisted the best documentary feature for the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you find that out? And sort of what was your reaction? How do you feel about that? Strangely enough, I was uh, I was actually in a, a, a yard of a friend of mine down here. Uh, there was an alligator uh, approaching through the weeds, and then someone was screaming behind me. It was my my daughter who said she just it was online and, uh, and and saw the announcement um, on the academy side and was calling for me. But I thought she was actually calling about the to run away from the alligator to stop playing with it. Um, that's how I found out. I mean, we, you know, we 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 had you know we had our fingers crossed. You know, the reception of the film has been astonishing. I mean, we premiered it over a year ago at Sundance and we finished it the day before the premiere is when we finished that film at Skywalker. I walked into the premiere with the, the DCP under my arm. So we, we hadn't shown it to anyone else uh, and we had, had no idea what to expect the Sundance. We had never shown it to an audience before, before that day. So luckily we had an incredible reaction from people who, who connected with it all over the world. Um, the film is, you know, it's a film's a celebration of human spirit and we wanted to make it because we fell in love with this this place and and these people you know they have a joy there's a, a happiness no lies and exuberance for life um and we wanted to share that uh, with an audience uh, so you know this as you know this past year has been a challenge it's really difficult so many people in so many ways uh you know we wanted to you know share the film uh but we couldn't uh to sh but we think that there's something very beautiful about sharing this world that's so that's so connected uh, with uh, with with everybody else, especially in a time where we're physically and culturally disconnected. We're all yearning for community, and this film shows this this community full of full of joy. Mm. What, what do you what do you think the secret is to that joy? Having spent so much time there. You know, it's interesting. You know, you, you when you think of an eighty or ninety year old person you think they're coming to, they're old and they're coming to the end of their life. And there's a line in the film where Carlos sitting with Maria at the dinner table and the, the conversation every day is the same. You need to stop truffle hunting because if you break your leg or break your hip, the farm is finished and we have to take care of you instead of the farm. And he turns to Maria and says, like, he, she says, you know, you're coming to the end of your life. Do you realize that? So you have to stop truffle hunting. He says, Maria, what if this is just the beginning? And this is at the time an 87 year old man who's now 89, an 87 year old man who thinks that he's gonna go on forever. And that's how everybody felt. I mean, you know, Aurelio 
Carlo, Aurelio, like you see him singing all the time and recording, but he break, breaks out in song all day, this man. And he's another one, he's, you know, 84 at the time. Um, so I, they, have, they have a joy in their life and they have this really beautiful connection to their dogs. They have an intimate connection to nature. You know, when you, when you ask any of them about how their dog is when they're not with their dog, they just tear up. Just say, how's Berba doing? I haven't seen Berba in a week, just tears. When you go to a forest, um, like one day, uh, Sergio called us um, crying at like five o'clock in the morning, saying, you have to come down here now. They're, they're, they're stripping the forest. They're cutting all the trees down. And we went down there and um, yeah, somebody had taken, two people had taken a chainsaw. They, they bought the, the firewood on the property. The, the, the 200 year old oak trees, they turned into firewood basically and destroyed these trees. And these trees were almost part of his family. I mean, for six or seven generations, he's been truffle hunting and you need, mm -hmm. you know, the truffle to attach themselves to the root of oak trees. You can't cultivate these. So year after year, they come back as long as everything is perfect and the soil is treated right and trees communicate with trees. They know, they, they know everything about a tree. They, they go home after a truffle hunt and they pull out these charts that, and they have years of these things and they have, gener and they have bookshelves behind them of generations of them. And they compare all the notes. The last time the lightning struck, the, they have water diviners that tell them you know, where the electric magnetic currents are in the soil because they think that has something to do with truffles go. The phases of the moon, they track everything. And they, they, when they find a truffle attached to a tree root, they write that down. It'll come back year after year. And they have all these different theories. So when somebody comes and cuts a tree down, it's like taking a piece of their, of their family down. So, you know, we had, um, you know, we had no, this is not by any means an impact film, uh, but we ended up falling in love with this, with this region. And we started a conservation program uh, because we, we wanted to stop this because what's happening in that region, because of climate change, it's, it used to be freezing. We're high, high up in the mountains. And this, they usually say there's two meters of snow when we were filming Christmas, but it was, it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So they were saying, you know, your van you're driving, a little friendly blue van you're driving with all your equipment, you'd never be able to get anywhere near this village, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So because it's now warmer, you can, they can plant vines, you know, grapevines where you couldn't plant them even five or six years ago. And with, with grapevines comes, you know, agri agricultural pollution, deforestation. So we've, we've raised quite a bit of money and, um, and we're, we, we gave it to a land trust that's there and they purchased the land where we made the film. And they're going to continue to do that. So wherever you shot the film in those forests, it'll be preserved, uh, you know, hopefully forever. And, and uh, because it, to us, it was, we couldn't figure out how do we preserve this community, right? How do we preserve what's, what the traditions that these, these men are doing? And the only way to do that is really to, to protect the forest that they've been protecting. That's the long answer, but that's the... Yeah. <laughs> No, that's great. Um, well, Michael, it's been so great talking to you about truffle hunters. And um, I, hopefully, are you going to be able to make it to the block party over there when they have the premiere? I hope so. I hope so. No yeah. block party without us. Yeah. Because yeah. you're invited. Imagine. You're invited. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. great. It's going to be a, it's going to be a hoot. Well, I imagine the pop, like they'll have like truffle on the popcorn, right? Like it'll be probably the. Well, we did. I have to say, you know, we did do that Sundance. We trade, we shaved white truffles on popcorn. The real. Oh, really? Truffle oils. Yeah. Truffle oil is not real. Truffle oil has no truffles in it. Yeah. But uh, it says it does, but it's a, it's a chemical compound, but real truffles, you know. Whoa. They let us, you know, the truffle hunters did, did some hunting and let us some truffles for Sundance. So we should do some shaving. What, what did it taste? Yes. What did the popcorn taste like? You know, it's really interesting. You don't know, just another little story, because this yeah. tells you exactly how a truffle tastes. Um, we, were, we, were tra we were following this one truffle hunter for, 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 for weeks and he hadn't found a thing. And then one final night, which is it's really cold, it's really freezing. Uh, we decided to you know, go one more time and he happened to find a little truffle finally. And usually when you find a truffle, they sell it to John Franco on the side of the road, the guy you see in the film. Uh, so we go with him and he says, no, I'm not, I'm not selling it. Follow me. So we hike with all of our equipment to his log cabin and he, he lights a fire with, you know, a wood burning stove, goes outside and gets chickens from his eggs, go, pulls out a cast iron skillet, cracks the eggs over the skillet, makes two fried eggs, makes eight fried eggs, puts them in a plate and starts shaving truffles on top. 
and then this perfume, you know, it's just the whole room fills with this beautiful perfume. And um, he said, this is for you. Uh, that's the first time we tasted a truffle, the very first time. And what it meant to us was like, imagine this guy, he said for seven months it had rain, so there was a drought. And he said, I hadn't found a truffle yet this season. And he decided to give his only truffle to us. And we've been with him through that forest, like foraging in the mud and the cold. But we realized like how, you know, you're tasting the forest, you're tasting the traditions. You're tasting the relationship that he has with his dog. You're tasting the sound of the owls that Carlos is listening to. You know, you're tasting all the things that Angelo, you know, Angelo loves the truffles, but he hates the idea of selling a truffle. You know, you, you, you taste all these things in the truffle. So it, it's almost like describing like the best perfume you've ever, you've ever smelled before. It's kind of like that, but it's just, it's, you're smelling this beautiful world that revolves around this little fungus that in three days is, is inedible. Like you see in, a, in that auction, that truffle sold for $100,000. $100,000 for a kilo. And it's gone three days. It's three days. You don't eat it. It's it's a piece of spongy fungus. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. my goodness. Uh, oh, so Michael, it's been so great talking and uh, people watching this can go to goldderby.com to make their award predictions and follow the award races. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.